All right. Good day, everybody. Um, good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are. We're, it's always great to see you on the Saturday, joining in on the Global Ubuntu Dialogue. Um, so today we'll be continuing with our collective action course. And Dr. Paul Easterling will be taking a different turn today. So he'll be continuing um, from where we stop. And he'll be con considering a topic that we have probably dealt with previously, but he'll be going to into it in more depth. Now, I just want to welcome you all, just to let you know that we are always putting out all of this conversation on our social media platform at Osiri Africa. So you can follow us on YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, and you know, other social media platform. Now, I just want to hand over the reins to Dr. Paul Easterly. It's good to have you. Good morning, thank you. Thank you very much. Can I uh, get a share screen so I can share my slide show? Yes. All right. All right, can you guys see it okay? Yes, indeed. You guys hear me okay? All right. All right, so um, just a reminder of what we've been doing so far this uh, term. Uh, we started out uh, on the first week, we talked about uh, the different types of Pan-Africanism as well as the, the long view of what Pan-African is. And then last week we went into um, uh, our Pan-African discussions dealing with what's been going on here in the new world and we focus particularly on the work of Kwame Nkrumah, uh, the uh, first president of Ghana. Uh, for this one, I'd like to talk about different manifestations of Pan-Africanism that have been going on in the last um, uh, 30, 40 years or so. Uh, so we'll deal with this, we'll call this the new age Pan-Africanism. This will start right around the 70s and, and move us on forward into the present day. So this is New Age Pan-Africanism, Afrocentricity, uh, BLM, Black Lives Matter, and SARS, and hip hop. All right. <clears throat> and please, uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and stop me. All right. So um, the uh, Pan uh, African Center paradigm, what we call Afrocentricity in the US, began with uh, a, uh, a scholar named Molefe Kete Asante of Temple University. And his basic understanding was to, or basic theory was when we were talking about uh, uh, black people, about African people, that we center our discussion in our own cultural experience, all right? He says, African culture and African experience is at the center of all analysis regarding African people. And this is uh, simply because for uh, uh, decades uh, and uh, centuries, African people have been studied from a Eurocentric analysis. They've tried to understand uh, Black people from their own cultural perspective rather than going to their cultural perspective, African cultural perspective, and understanding what it means to be African from an African, cult African cultural perspective, not just a European one. All right, so, he uh, goes on to say, uh, centrism is the groundedness of observation and behavior in one's own historical experience that shapes, uh, the con that shapes the concepts, paradigms, theories, and methods, all right? Again, this is just centering what you're talking about, what, how you study yourself from your own experience. This is, this, that's all it's saying, centering from your own experience. Uh, Afrocology is sustained by a commitment to centering the study of African phenomena and events in a particular cultural voice of the composite African people. Now, uh, he is uh, working to understand African people as one global people. And while African people have many languages and many perspectives and are no, in no way homogeneous, um, he searches to, or he works to find a common space where African people can and can understand each other on one accord. <clears throat> and he argues, oh, excuse me. 
he argues that there is, should be a, a pluralism of centrism, that each group of people has the right and responsibility to view and analyze the world from their own experiential and cultural background. So this is to say that uh, Afrocentricity uh, is not for everybody, um, as some would assume that Eurocentricity is, that Eurocentricity should be a blanket concept that covers all peoples. He argues that Afrocentricity is not like this. Every people are responsible for speaking their own cultural truth. And I think that's an important, an important perspective. All right, uh, just to give you uh, more context on the Afrocentric paradigm, uh, Carter G. Woodson stated, Carter G. Woodson was the, um, was the scholar who developed the idea for uh, Black History Month uh, almost 100 years ago. He says that when you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. You do not have to tell him not to stand there or go yonder. He will find his proper place. He will stay in it. You do not need to send him to the back door. He will go without being told. In fact, if there is no back door, he will cut one for a special benefit. For, he will cut one for a special benefit. His education makes this necessary. And what he's uh, basically saying is that when society is, is built in such a way to where uh, you have an entire um, uh, group of people who are second class citizens, and, and this continues over time, those people will start to make their own place will start to become comfortable in the second class citizenship and will start living their lives in such a way that they they find uh, uh there's their second class citizenship wherever it is they don't have to be told they don't have to be pointed towards it it's just that's how it is all right and Arturo Schomburg who developed the uh Schomburg library in Harlem New York uh, which is one of the more um, important libraries for uh, the study of African people in the United States. He says that we need the historian and philosopher to give us the trenchant pen, the story of our forefathers and let our soul and body with the uh, phosphorescent light brighten the chasm that separates, separates us. We should cling to them just as blood is, is thicker, excuse me, uh, than water. Um, again, he's speaking to this need to speak our own historical truth. And uh, John Henry Clark argues that history is not everything, but it is it's a starting point. History is a clock that people use to tell their political, cultural time of day. It is a compass they use to find themselves on the map of human geography. It tells them where they are, and more importantly, what they must be. Again, this is just pointing to the particular history that we must embrace in order to uh, fulfill ourselves as a people. African people should study, should study the world from an African-centered point of view, as Asian people should study from their point of view, a Latin uh, should study from their point of view, and white people should study from their point of view as well. To understand your perspective is uh, a way of, of feeding into the, the, the completeness of, of our human story. That's why Afrocentricity is important as a paradigm. Uh, uh, he states further, uh, Alma Mazama, uh, one of our leading scholars, Al Alma Mazama argues that Afrocentricity contends that our main problem as African people is our usual unconsciousness adoption of Western worldview and the perspective and the, their intended conceptual frameworks. The list of those ideas and theories that have invaded our lives as normal, natural, and even worse ideal is infinite saying that we just, uh, um, he's, she's saying that when we see white people as being the norm, we, we, and we look at ourselves as not being that norm, we start to degrade ourselves as human beings. Our failure to recognize the roots of such ideas in the European cultural ethos has led us willingly or unwillingly to agree to footnote status in the, in the white man's book. Right, we're, we're, not, we're not telling our own story, we're just a, a, a part of somebody else's story. And that's the key for Afrocentricity. We thus find ourselves relegated to a periphery, the margin of European experience, to use Malefi Asante's term, spectators of a show that defines us from without, not define us from within. All right, these are key words. In other words, 
And to use Afrocentricity terminology again, we do not exist on our own terms, but on borrowed European ones. Again, this is a critical. We must be able to tell our own stories in order for, him, or in order for, us, for us to be able to uh, uh, fully re uh, realize our humanity. And she also says, the challenge is monumental, speaking of you know, how we, we move towards a more African-centered perspective. Our liberation and Afrocentricity contends that contends and rests upon our ability to systematically displace European ways of thinking, being, feeling, and so forth, and consciously replace them with ways that are germane to our own cultural experiences. She also states that Afrocent the Afrocentric idea rests on the assertion of the primacy of African experience for African people. All right, African experience for African people. This is not to say that we have to impose or colonize other peoples with our perspective. Its aim is to give our African, give us our African victorious consciousness back. In the process, it also means viewing European voice as just one of many, not necessarily the wisest one. And I wanna uh, stop there in order to allow for uh, um, a little bit of conversation with Dr. Umogo. If, uh, yeah. Great, great. I was yes. just um, trying to write down, pen down my thoughts so that I don't forget. Yes, um, yes. Yes, you said something about, you know, when you started talking about the Afrocentric paradigm and you, you know, you started off with the uh, person who started off the Black Life Matters and how education is, is central to this. Now, you actually answered one part of my question with Ama Mazama's um, view about education. So basically re replacing Eurocentric ways of thinking with, you know, African culture. Now, yes. the question here is because a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of people like us, Africans, um, some of them are not very open to embracing, you know, this sort of education. So how, how can these be done in reality? How can you get people to understand the importance of replacing, you know, the Eurocentric ways of thinking with the African ways? Because some of them feel that the African ways are dated, it's archaic, you know, so if you can chime in, you know, probably just say something about that. Yeah, that, um, well, that is the, uh, that is the challenge that, um, that scholars um, like Dr. Asante and others have uh, faced for, for decades is trying to, to work to, um, sadly, to convince our people that in, you know, it is important for us to study ourselves from our own perspective. And one of the uh, best ways to do that um, is to start young, is to start young, to start with our children. Um, uh, um, and again, you know, this is not easy because some parents are not into this. So of course they won't teach their children like that. Um, but we have to find ways uh, to do it. But for those of us who do know, uh, uh, we must uh, start young to teach our children from a young age who they are, uh, uh, the beauty of, of Africa, and the, and the beauty of diversity, um, because Afrocentricity, at its root, is it's 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 meant to be pluralistic. It's it's meant to be a perspective, you know, for African people, but it's not meant to be a perspective for all people. Because Europeans also have the right to speak their truth, as do Asians and Latinos and the other and the other people on this earth. So that is the the root of the issue is just allowing people, a people. Uh, the different people to speak their own truth rather than having a particular perspective thrust upon them, as has uh, been the case historically with Eurocentricity. Hmm. So, yeah, it, it, the best way is to start young. For those who know, start young and, you know, and talk to your friends and family about that as well. This is, <laughs> uh, you know, personally speaking, this is a struggle that I've, I've, I've dealt with for a, a number of years. Um, you know, trying to just talk to my parents even. Um, but uh, uh, luckily for me, I was able to make some inroads with my father because um, we, we traveled to Africa about 15 years ago. And uh, he traveled there just on the strength of me 
sharing, you know, what I've learned, you know, so I was able to reach up and now, you know, to my dad and now with my own children and my, um, my grandchild, I can reach down and, you know, tell them and they teach them uh, things that, you know, I was never taught. So the best way is just to work with your family and your friends and, and, and try to get them as young as possible. And, and don't talk down to people who, who might not get it at first. Because we don't want to turn people off. We don't want to make people believe that they're less than. Um, but, you know, we just want to, you know, try to reach out to them. So uh, go ahead. Okay. Well, so it's all about getting people into comfortable spaces where they can talk yeah. about things like yeah. this. Because yeah. again, um, a, a lot of people kind of shy away from this. A lot of people are considered um, a very what's the word now i'm trying to look for right word to to kind of explain what i'm saying so when you begin to have this sort of conversation people think you're being confrontational yeah um, people feel like you know you're trying to seek notice or you're trying to draw attention right. um, to yourself. and and sometimes i think that is why you know africans sometimes may not be willing to to you know have these conversations now another thing i wanted to ask is are there any strategic um structures or, or institution that can help facilitate these conversations and, and kind of get people into that space so you said catch them young but then we have a lot of people who are already grown up and you know are there, is there something you can say about you know structures and institutions that can get them into that space where they have this conversation freely uh, well, you know, not to toot our own horn, but your, uh, Osiri University is definitely a place that is developing to be that. Um, there are, in addition to that, there are uh, many African-centered um, institutions for uh, younger uh, people uh, spread out throughout the United States. Now, this is the United States, so I understand the limitations of those who may be uh, living on the continent or uh, in the... Um, in the Caribbean or South America and Central America. Uh, so, but that's why it is important for us to, to reach out as much as possible to, to spread our knowledge to open schools and institutions such as this um, in order to, to reach, reach others. Um, I mean, African people are number a billion on this planet. So the, the, the job that we have uh, ahead of us to try to reach our people is not an easy one. Uh, but it is definitely a necessary one. Thank you, Dr. Paul. Yeah. Um, Professor Orsiri, please, do you want to chime in? Yes. Um, so I think um, Dr. Paul nailed it perfectly. Just to tow that line a little bit further, I feel that we may be underestimating the power of purpose. I believe that ultimately a lot of us are seeking purpose. We are looking for life's meaning. And, and now I'm gonna be very brutal and starkly honest. Based on my analysis, I think African people are like a folk, a, a people who are groping in the dark. They are looking for purpose, looking for the light. Now, I'm not saying it's their, it's their fault, but they are certainly looking for purpose. And I think within that uh, pursuit of purpose, there is something that we can offer people, and that is sacrifice. I believe that there is no purpose or meaningful life without sacrifice there's got to be sacrifice in order for us to live out our true meaning. So, you know, for, for, for the adults, because that's a very good question that you've asked. For the adults, um, I, I support what Dr. Paul Easterling said, you know, we should create institutions. But what that really means is we should give people purpose because the institution should be about helping people figure out what their life's meaning is all about within their cultural context, you know? So, and, and we should not be afraid to tell folks to pay the price, to sacrifice. For example, whatever, I mean, let me stop beating about the bush. You cannot keep talking about 
you know, let's build up Africa. And you don't want to go pick up um, the machete or the tractor and till the ground and grow something on, your, on, on the African soil and yeah. make something. Yeah. You, can, you cannot keep saying, oh, we want to develop Africa and you don't want to take time to build something in Africa, to create jobs in Africa, to believe in the people. And you want to keep on buying stuff and importing stuff. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. Yeah. Is, you, should, you can do that. But you got to pay the price first. You got to pay the price. And as you pay the price, you get purpose. Yeah. So that's why I think, you know, the institutions that Dr. Paul is, is talking about, it ought to be doing, yeah. steering folks back to the idea of tilling the ground and paying the price as a sacrificer. Yeah, and work where you're at. Work, work where you're at. Um, a lot of African Americans have this romantic notion of Africa, like if we make it to the continent, everything will be okay. And um, while Africa is very beautiful, I, I'd say fight where you are. Mm. Fight where you are. Stand your ground, right? And fight where you are. And, and that you know that does not mean physically fighting. It, it means you know, again, teach your kids and teach your family as well as clean up your neighborhood, right? <laughs> you know, clean up, your, clean up your neighborhood. You know, I live in Baltimore and this is, um, <laughs> this is a rough city. And, you know, um, one of the roughest things about it, you know, besides the murders and the you know, police violence, it's just, it's, it's dirty everywhere. Mm -hmm. And if we want a nice community, you know, clean up where you're at, clean up your own mm -hmm. yard and work where you're at. Work where I, you're think, at. I think the yeah. fact is that a lot of people are tired out. So maybe to add to what you're saying, I think we need a lot of comrade spirit. So when you get more people, more hands on deck, yeah. it makes you load the burden lighter. Yeah. Um, because again, you find yourself faced against institutions that are beyond you. And, yeah. and most times it's difficult even to fight the government, um, like you're trying to say. And they make, they make the effort. So I think also in addition to what you're saying, probably building comrade spirit and getting people who share the same ideology yeah. to kind of get your hands all on deck. Uh, there, there are a couple of very interesting uh, points being raised on the chat. And one of the, one of the persons with uh, Mazi Caesar is saying, frankly speaking, if I had not read Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness before reading Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have had a first-hand understanding of the Eurocentric view of Africa and the Afrocentric view about Africa. Yeah. After reading, reading The Heart of Darkness, I read Achebe and I saw the reason why he wrote things fall apart as a sharp reaction against whatever Conrad has written. Right. You know, kind of very interesting, and I, and I, do, I do appreciate that, Mazik uh, Caesar. Now, Hani Hani is asking a question, um, Dr. Paul. Mm -hmm. He's saying, where do we start from with this kind of conversation? I need some tips. I actually ask my brethren, African-Americans, if they would be interested in knowing about their African uh, about their African uh, heritage, mm -hmm. if they ever were interested in knowing where their grandparents came from, maybe that's a good approach. That's what he's saying. So I don't know if you have something else to add. Yeah, um, yeah. Like I said, I, I, I start with your family. I start with your neighborhood. Start with those closest to you. And I know, um, you know, with our global world, you know, it's easy to access. Um, the rest of the world is easy to, to spread our own uh, theories and notions into the world. Um, but, you know, it's, it's nothing beats, you know, good one-on-one -on -one conversation with those that you are physically closest to. And, you know, we're, we're working to develop our, 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 or to build this world into a better place. You know, again, just, just start where you are, you know, start where you are. As they say, you know, cast your bucket down where you are. The water is already clean, you know, just all you got to do is, is dig right there. Yeah, yeah. And I think he's trying to buttress the fact, um, saying that there's a phenomenon going on right now. Some African-Americans are taking a step forward and going back to Africa to yep. settle. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. That's all for me for now. Yeah. You can carry yeah. on. Definitely. All right. Let me uh, go back to the...
All right, can you guys see this still? Yes, please. All right, good. All right, so um, again, the point of this, this course is to uh, discuss the, the innovations and in, in different ways we have moved and grown collectively. And uh, I, I put one slide for the hip hop movement in there because I argue that uh, the hip hop movement, um, like all African music is an example of us pushing against the dominant culture in order to solidify ourselves culturally and to speak to our own experience. And so uh, um, hip hop culture for me, and this is a preview of, of the hip hop class that Osiri is offering, um, hip hop culture is, is a way, uh, is a method of protest. It's a method of cultural, nonviolent cultural protest that we use uh, um, the stuff that's around us to develop uh, beautiful sounds and, and, and dynamic ideas in order to in order to move our own culture forward. Um, uh, hip hop, uh, as it is uh, defined by KRS-One, is intelligent movement. You know, to be hip to something is to be aware of something and to hop around is, is a movement. So hip hop, intelligent movement. And so hip hop also brings together the past combined with the present with an eye towards the future. So we bring all the music of our past all the way back from Africa to deal with our present so we can create a better future, all right? So again, I argue that uh, uh, our, our hip hop culture is important in the struggle because it, it provides an example of how uh, uh, we can build something from nothing, all right? And um, so I just wanted to put that uh, one piece out there. So uh, moving forward, uh, we'll talk about the uh, Black Lives Matter movement uh, briefly. Uh, the movement was started by uh, these three uh, sisters, Alicia Garza, Patrice Coulors, and Opal to, uh, to Tometi. <laughs> I have a, a hard time with her name. So the point of uh, Black, Black Lives Matter was founded in 2000, 2003 in response to the Trayvon Martin murder. So uh, just to stop there, um, Black Lives Matter w was not started against police brutality. It was started against a civilian, uh, George Zimmerman, who killed another civilian, Trayvon Martin, because he was in the, um, he, was, he was not welcome in his own neighborhood, all right? So just to be clear, it didn't start because of police violence though police violence is a critical part of the movement, it started because a civilian killed another civilian merely because he was black and out at night. Uh, black Lives Matter, a global network foundation is a global organization in the US, UK, and Canada whose mission is to eradicate white supremacy and to build local power, emphasis local power, to intervene in violence inflicted upon black communities by state, and by the state and vigilantes, the vigilantes again, as speaking to George Zimmerman, uh, by combating the counter, uh, countering acts of violence, cr uh, creating space for black imagination and innovation and centering on black joy, uh, we, are, uh, we are winning immediate uh, improvements in our lives, all right? And I, um, I showed these two uh, images on the, uh, on what is my right side, uh, We Shall Overcome and Black Lives Matter to show the continuity of struggle, all right? Show that, you know, what was going on 70 years ago, right? 70 years ago is 1950, so about 60, 70 years ago, uh, which is not, you know, not an insignificant amount of time to what's going on right now in 2020 and how this is a consistent issue that needs to be addressed by each generation and it will continue to go on until we have serious conversation about uh, Black Lives Matter and, and what, what Black lives mean to, to us and to the country. So to push forward, I uh, have a video here that I wanted to share of a young woman, uh, her name is Kimberly Jones, uh, a writer and activist who spoke very uh, bluntly about what Black Lives Matter means uh, for, for her.
So. So when you, you have to unshare back, unshare, and when you okay. try to share again, click on um, audio. All right. Your computer shell. All right, got it. A lot of things talking of the people making commentary. Um, interestingly enough, the ones I've noticed that have been making the commentary are wealthy black people making the commentary about we should not be um, rioting, we should not be looting, we should not be tearing up our own communities. And then there's been an argument of the other side of we should be hitting them in the pocket. We should be focusing on the blackout days where we don't spend money. Um, but, you know, I feel like we should do both. And I feel like I support both. And I'll tell you why I support both. I support both because there, when you have a civil unrest like this, there are three types of people in the streets. There are the protesters, there are the rioters, and there are the looters. The protesters are there because they actually care about what is happening in the community. They want to raise their voices and they are there strictly to protest. You have the rioters who are angry, who are anarchists, who really just want to shit up and that's what they're going to do regardless. And then you have the looters. And the looters almost exclusively are just there to do that, to loot. Now, people are like, well, what did you gain? Well, what did you get from looting? I think that as long as we're focusing on the what, we're not focusing on the why, and that's my issue with that. As long as we're focusing on what they're doing, we're not focusing on why they're doing. And some people are like, well, those aren't people who are legitimately angry about what's happening. Those are people who just want to get stuff. Okay, well then, let's go with that. Let's say that's what it is. Let's ask ourselves why in this country in 2020, the financial gap between poor blacks and the rest of the world is at such a distance that people feel like their only hope and only opportunity to get some of the things that we flaunt and flash in front of them all the time is to walk through a broken glass window and get it. That they are so hopeless that getting that necklace, getting that TV, getting that change, getting that bed, getting that phone, whatever it is that they're going to get is that in that moment when the riots happen and if they present an opportunity of looting that's their only opportunity to get it we need to be questioning that why why are people that poor why are people that broke why are people that that food insecure that clothing insecure that they feel like their only shot that they are shooting their shot by walking through a broken glass window to get what they need. And then people want to talk about, well, there's plenty of people who pulled themselves up by their bootstraps and got it on their own. Why can't they do that? Let me explain to you something about economics in America. And I'm so glad that as a child, I got an opportunity to spend time at PUSH where they taught me this, is that we must never forget that economics was the reason that black people were brought to this country. We came to do the agricultural work in the South and the textile work in the North. Do you understand that? That's what we came to do. We came to do the agricultural work in the South and the textile work in the North. Now, if I right now, if I right now decided that I wanted to play Monopoly with you and for 400 rounds of playing Monopoly, I didn't allow you to have any money. I didn't allow you to have anything on the board. I didn't allow for you to have anything. And then we played another 50 rounds of Monopoly and everything that you gained and you earned while you were playing that round of Monopoly was taken from you. That was Tulsa. That was Rosewood. There are pla those are places where we built black economic wealth, where we were self-sufficient, where we owned our store where we owned our property and they burned them to the ground. So that's 450 years. So for 400 rounds of Monopoly, you don't get to play at all. Not only do you not get to play, you have to play on the behalf of the person that you're playing against. You have to play and make money and earn wealth for them and then you have to turn it over to them. So then for 50 years, you finally get a little bit and you're allowed to play. And every time that they don't like the way that you're playing or that you're catching up or that you're doing something to be self-sufficient, they burn your game. They burn your cards. They burn your monopoly money.
And then finally at the release and the onset of that, they allow you to play and they say, okay, now you catch up. Now at this point, the only way you're gonna catch up in the game is if the person shares the wealth, correct? But what if every time you share the wealth, then there's psychological warfare against you to say, oh, you're an equal opportunity higher. So if I played 400 rounds of Monopoly with you and I had to play and give you every dime that I made, and then for 50 years, every time that I played, I, if you didn't like what I did, you got to burn it like they did in Tulsa and like they did in Rosewood, how can you win? How can you win? You can't win. The game is fixed. So when they say, why do you burn down the community? Why do you burn down your own neighborhood? It's not ours. We don't own anything. We don't own anything. There is, Trevor Noah said it so beautifully last night. There's a social contract that we all have that if you steal or if I steal, then the person who is the authority comes in and they fix the situation. But the person who fixes the situation is killing us. So the social contract is broken. And if the social contract is broken, why the f do I give a shit about burning the football hall of fame, about burning a target? You broke the contract when you killed us in the streets and didn't give up. You broke the contract when for 400 years we played your game and built your wealth. You broke the contract when we built our wealth again on our own by our bootstraps in Tulsa and you dropped bombs on us. When we built it in Rosewood and you came in and you slaughtered us. You broke the contract, so your target. Your Hall of Fame. As far as I'm concerned, they could burn this bitch to the ground. And it still wouldn't be enough. And they are lucky that what black people are looking for is equality and not revenge. All right. You guys still hear me? All right. Oh, so we can uh, stop right there and you know allow for a few uh, questions or a little conversation on that point before we move on to Ain Sars. Well, um, this is kind of very moving. Just watching that. Um, before I go ahead to comment, I. I would want to draw attention to some of the questions on the chat. Yeah. Maybe that could help start up um, some of the conversations that we're having. Um, Mamo Machi, uh, Professor Mamo is just reading something. He says, why are Africans always fighting Africans by treating one another as foreigners rather than brothers and sisters? We talk about brotherhood and sisterhood, but we practice <clears throat> and do it and do as if we are foreigners to one another. Uh, trust me, this is a major challenge. We must find a way not to talk Ubuntu, but to do it, how we can do it, uh, how we can do a mindset change to make our Africanhood, to make us change makers and to make us game changers. Wow. Yeah. Do you have any comment on that, Dr. Paul? Uh, yes. Um, uh, we are at a critical uh, juncture in, in our history. And, and I agree with uh, um, uh, Dr. Munchie's uh, um, um, discussion that oh you know we we do need each other we 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 must see the connection and while well, I say we're at a critical juncture is because this uh, BLM thing th is going on at the same time that NSARS is and there's uh, there's other things happen around the continent and as well in the diaspora uh, um, the Caribbean that are speaking to the exact same issues at the exact same time so if if we are able to um, uh, take control of this moment, to take agency in this moment, um, we could have some dynamic, uh, um, um, dynamic movement towards something better. And, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's difficult because, you know, it, it seems that we're constantly fighting and we're surrounded and, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to find hope. But I try to look at those moments such as now that kind of remind me, you know, how we are all connected. And right now, the, the, you know, it's, it's obvious. The world is showing us that, that you know, what's going on in, in, in uh, um, Minnesota is going on in Lagos, right? So we have to seize 
are, are these moments when, when we are presented with them. And, and, you know, and we have to seize them with a keen eye uh, towards the future, not just the past. But the thing is, how can we heal? I mean, that's something very interesting Honey Honey has just brought up. We have all of these scars. How can we look past these scars to see something productive and do something productive and move ourselves forward from the past? Because it seems as if we are constantly looking back and constantly, yes, it's good to look back. It's good to reflect in that way, you know, if I may say, but not looking back and, you know, you're still taking on the pain in a negative way, rather in a positive way and kind of moving ourselves forward. Because I think that this is a challenge right now. It is. Yes. Um... <sighs> All right, I have to make this very personal. It's, it's not academic at this point. So if we are to move forward, each individual will have to look within themselves and find their own reason to fight. I, can't, I cannot give it to you. I can, I can explain to you, express to you all day long uh, the problems uh, and, and why, I, why I fight. You know, I, I want to see my kids have a better world. I want to see your kids have a better world. I, really, I genuinely want that. Uh, to, to create a better world for all of our kids. But that's, that's, that's my reason to fight. Every individual is, needs to find their own reason to fight, to find a way to, to, to <laughs> find a way to understand why they're here in the first place and, and, and what they want uh, for themselves and for their family and for the future. And um, I, I, can't, I can't give anybody any reason to fight. I can only find my own. I can only help my family and my friends find their own as well. And hopefully that we can connect on a number of levels and move forward together. But it, it, you know, to those people I'm not connected with, you know, you, you have to, you have to work and find it within yourself. Um, because if somebody else gives it to you and, and, and if that person fails you in some way, you, you, you know, you'll fall back into the same thing and say, Oh, it was never anything in the first place. Right. You have to find it for yourself. You have to find it for yourself. You know, win, lose, or draw, it has to be, uh, it has to, we have to take responsibility for it, for ourselves. And, and I, I have no better answer than that. Thank you, Dr. Paul. Um, Professor Kano, do you want to chime in, please? Yes. Um, you know, I went to Grambling State University you know, for my undergraduate. And then for my PhD, I went to Louisiana State, both in the same state. I was shocked when I drove into LSU for the first time. Mm. It was the most beautiful campus, most elegant, beautiful campus you would ever see. And I couldn't imagine I was still in Louisiana. <laughs> so there's a stark contrast in the terms of, in, 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 the, in the amount of resources that Grambling had compared to, to LSU per student. But so, so I'm, I'm sharing this to say there is no denying that African Americans have suffered the brunt of, of, uh, of uh, an institution or institutions that were built against them. There's no denying about that. And, and we still leave that out today. Just look at the neighborhoods, look at the zip codes. Mm -hmm. You see where the poor folks live in the U.S. So, I mean, I am, a, a, I am, a, I am convinced that we still have terrible institutions. But the question is, how do we move forward, right? right? For me, I, in, in great humility, I, I have resolved to approach this from a positive psychology point of view, to say, okay, now, this has been done to us, okay? And, and now we are, in, we are in this time now, this is a 21st century media age. I mean, Let's face it, I mean, I wouldn't say we are totally out of the woods, but we, we have certain freedoms now that our ancestors fought for and died for. Heck, let's capitalize on those freedoms that have fought for. In other words, let's start banding together and working together to create more opportunities for ourselves, to do some things for ourselves. I don't, I don't think, again, in my humble opinion, I don't think that 
we, if we build uh, businesses now, that they will be burnt down the way they were burnt down years ago. That was why they fought. That was why Martin Luther King gave his life. That was why Malcolm X gave his life. Because they were burning us down, burning our buildings down and our businesses down. I think we can start building again. So I don't, we shouldn't fixate in the idea that whatever we do, we get knocked down. They will fight. There are other ways that people are fighting against us. No doubt about it. I mean, I'm not naive at all, at all. You know, there's other ways. But I think we definitely have it better now. So what, what I'm saying is, let's try to do more faster. That's why I'm so excited about what we're doing here at the Surrey University. We have folks like yourself, Dr. Marachi, in the UK. We have Dr. Paul Listerling, uh, who lives in Maryland. We have Professor Mamu Muche in South Africa. We have us coming together from different parts of the world saying, let's build something together. Let's help our people together. Let's move forward. And I think we can do it. Yeah. That's, that, that's what I think we can do. Let's keep an eye on the hope that we can um, exploit. Thank yeah. you very much. Dr. Uh, Paul. Uh, uh, yeah, that um, it touches on a critical point of, of working together. Um, uh, you know, when the civil rights movement was going on in, in the U.S., um, you know, things were happening, you know, other movements were going on across the, the world. And, you know, there was not a strong connection as, as there needed to be, you know, because there were, there were similar issues, but we weren't connected, right? We, we knew of the struggles. We were maybe touching, you know, our fingertips with each other, but we weren't connected as we uh, needed to be. Um, now, I, I agree with uh, uh, Dr. Osiri is that, you know, now we are here, we are able to, to connect like this because of, uh, of our exposure to each other's struggle and, and through media, um, you know, and through these, through these channels that, that simply did not exist uh, 70 years ago. So we, we are at a, a critical juncture again I believe we're at a critical juncture for movement and, and uh, we just, you know, have to, to seize, to seize the day, <laughs> you seize the moment and, and, and work the best we can to, uh, to move forward. But it's, it's, it's going to be a struggle. Uh, it's, it's still going to be an arduous struggle and a long, long struggle. Um, so I'll just uh, move forward on that, you know, just to finish off. Um, um, and this brings us to uh, end SARS, the end the special anti-robbery squad uh, uh, of Nigeria and uh, what's going on right now, uh, right this moment uh, um, in the country of Nigeria. Um, the uh, uh, SARS um, uh, unit was developed in 1992, uh, where mass poli a mass police unit direct, uh, directed towards addressing uh, violent uh, crimes. Um, I have to say that anytime your police are wearing masks, that's a huge problem. That's going to be a problem. Anytime you can't identify your oppressor, um, you know, the KKK wears masks, right? So, so they're not identified, so they can't be shamed publicly. So that, that was already a problem when you got your police force wearing masks. And so um, uh, the corruption of the police uh, within Nigeria was, you know, uh, made obvious, you know, with this NSARS movie, you had uh, um, police that would rob, you know, normal, regular citizens, uh, uh, you know, and, and you know, be brutal and, and, and kill people and, and drag people off in the middle of the night. Um, so protests against this uh, began uh, in, two, uh, in 2016, so roughly four years ago, uh, and the protests... Um, and you know they they started moving, and I, what I mean, they the citizens of Nigeria started moving against the corruption and police brutality that uh, came with the NSARS movement. And um, throughout the history of this, uh, they've promised there've been their promises have been made to dis dis disband uh, the SARS. Um, but the question that came with it was, if you disband SARS, uh, what's coming up next? Because what's coming up next could be just as bad if not worse than in the SARS movement. And what needs to be addressed is, is the corruption in the police them, themselves. So the demands that were made uh, by um, 
the uh, SARS movement that has been going on uh, this year is the immediate release of, of protesters, people who are moving against police brutality, um, you know, because it's their right to protest, so we release these people. Uh, justice for those killed uh, through uh, police brutality, and I know there are a great many uh, numbers of people who have been brutalized and killed by uh, the police. Uh, so to address that uh, would ho hopefully lead to some uh, healing across uh, across the country. And I think that is definitely the point for moving towards justice. Um, you have uh, a special body to investigate police misconduct. Um, that's also what we're working towards here in the States is develop independent bodies to investigate this police misconduct. And I say independent bodies because a lot of the times when investigation of police misconduct is going on, it's investigated by, by the police. So you have the police investigating the police misconduct. It seems like a a problem, right? A, a conflict of interest. Um, a furthermore, psychological evaluation and retraining of SARS officers. That's also an issue here in the States where we're pushing for our police to have four-year degree, degrees, not just high school diplomas, you know, because the assumption is that a greater education would, would lead to a, a, a greater understanding and, and greater uh, access or a greater uh, human empathy. Uh, and uh, adequate uh, police salaries, because uh, the assumption is that the police are, are, are um, you know, taking and robbing because their own salaries are not adequate for the lifestyles that they, that they uh, wish to live. Um, so moving forward again, uh, I just have a brief video from um, uh, Al Jazeera that I'll share uh, right now. Just so you know, the video is not. Um, can you can you hear it, Dr. Amara? Is it not clear? No. No, we, we don't no. see the video. You should share your screen and um, and also click on audio while you share. Yes. All right. I thought it was shared. Let me. Uh... All right. All right, let's do this one more time. Okay. Your computer sound like that, all right. All right. Ah. Clashes on the streets of Abuja. A group of young men armed with clubs and other weapons arrive at busy intersection, already cut off by protesters. They set about smashing parked vehicles. And they Clashes chase protesters on the streets against of police Abuja. brutality. A group of young men but armed the with clubs and other weapons arrive at busy intersection, already cut off by protesters. They set about smashing parked vehicles. And they chase protesters against police brutality. But the tables were turned when protesters chased the attackers who began to retreat. Not all of them got away. The running battles lasted more than half an hour. Watched by the police less than 200 meters away, 
Protesters say the attackers were brought to the scene in two trucks. It's the demonstrators who turned around to help victims of their beating to parked ambulances. This woman's car was one of several badly damaged. The protest began peacefully in the morning as Nigerians of all ages pressed home their demand for accountability from government security forces. Nationwide rallies which started last week against a notorious police unit implicated in extrajudicial killings and torture succeeded in getting the government to abolish the special anti robbery squad. But the announcement of replacement SWAT unit to fight violent crimes further angered protesters. They should end SAS. We don't want him to dissolve it. We don't want him to form another name. They should end it. Enough is enough. Now, how do, how do the police deal with violent crimes like robbery, kidnapping, and all that? There are so many ways to deal with it. There are so many ways. It's not by killing people that um, criminality can be stopped in Nigeria. You, can, you can't kill everybody. The latest protests disrupted traffic in businesses in parts of Abuja. Demonstrators say police reform is just a part of their demands. They want to push further to hold not only security agencies accountable, but to demand good governance from Nigeria's elected leaders. In the country's most popular state, Lagos, protests were largely peaceful. You have no reason, we have no reason to attack you because you have no reason to attack police. We have no reason to attack any protester for whatever reason we don't have. But it's attacks such as these in Abuja by what protesters say were paid thugs that are raising particular concerns of instigating a new crisis in a country already dealing with several others such as the coronavirus and Boko Haram. Ahmed Idris, Al Jazeera, Abuja. All right, I'll go ahead and stop there as uh, my end of my presentation. Um, again, there's you know, there's a lot of similar issues that are being dealt with uh, in Nigeria. You know, as compared to the United States, they they seem almost identical. Um, so again, I, I believe we're at a, a critical uh, historical moment to where you know these struggles are lining up, much like they did during the civil rights. Uh, a movement and the anti-colonial movement uh, that took place uh, 50, 60, uh, 70 years ago. The, 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 you know, the, as they say, the, the stars are aligning. And um, I don't know how many more chances we'll get for the stars to align like this. But again, I think it's important that we seize the moment and, and connect our struggles. And so we can uh, move forward uh, collectively uh, towards a, a better future. And um, yeah, again, that is the, you know, the point of this, you know, collective action course is, you know, understanding our, our struggles and coming up with ways so we can move towards a more productive uh, future. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Paul. I mean, the corruption in government is so endemic, especially in Africa. And, you know, taking a case study, someone just mentioned it on the chat of Ghana, um, using Jerry, uh, President Jerry Rollins' approach to <laughs> sort of overturn things. I, I don't know if that's yeah. just something that happened one time in history, but I, I think we'll, our government would do with a little bit of overhaul um, in Africa. Uh, sad, but that's what it is. Uh, so again, I just want to thank you for today's um, lecture. Uh, it, we kind of found a lot of value in it. So thank you so very much for coming again and educating us on things that, you know, are rarely talked about. Now, I just want to well, uh, say thank you to all our attendees and even you know people who is coming today. Thank you so very much, and, and even our elders. Some of our elders actually uh, joined in, so thank you for coming. Uh, we've sent a link for our elders um, workshop, so please, if you can use the link that was sent to you to join in, we would appreciate that. So. We